and we're recording. Let me see what we're going on. What's going on on our other feed? I'm supposed to remind you about audio for Facebook. No. <laughs> oh, okay, go. <laughs> and through live studio. Okay. All right. And this will be. Huh. Okay, I am having a little bit of trouble here. So sorry. With it connected to restream. All right, here we go. It's preparing. Oh my goodness, are you kidding me? Hmm. Oh, I'm if Kenny could uh, mute himself, because I keep hearing these weird echoey background noises. I think you're signed up twice, Kenny. Yeah. And that's probably causing the uh, feedback. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share uh, using my, um, come on, we are really, there we go. We're just going to, we're sharing the, um, the webinar window. So this is as good as it gets. Yay, welcome, welcome everyone to the Parental Alienation Awareness Panel Discussion, uh, April 25th annually, for those who are not aware, is Parental Alienation Awareness Day. Um, and uh, so that's where there's, why there's so much activity all over the place. And in fact, I think several of you, especially, I know Dr. Bur uh, Burnett, you had a couple of things going on at the same time. And I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to choose to share with uh, uh, us uh, your wisdoms. Um, okay, so I want to go ahead and talk about. Uh, so we're we are kids need both, and our mission. We're a nonprofit organization that started in 2004. Our mission is to help restore the eternal unity of the family bond through collaboration with family stabilization professionals, um, such as those who are here. Um, this year we created, and we're in the pre-launch phase of uh, a platform community called Hope for Families. The purpose of the platform is to support organizations, experts, and advocates by calling, causing their effectiveness and expansion. Um, our platform serves the whole community, dealing with high conflict custody matters. We offer professionals event management, collaborative promotion, uh, monetizing courses, course builder, and groups, community groups, and things like that. Um, and we also offer the individuals seeking knowledge and support and expertise a place to find what and who they need for the restoration of their families. So um, ground rules are... Um, is that since we have participants coming from multiple platforms, we have uh, Caroline Rena, which is one of our, who are one of our panelists. She's going to be managing our Zoom webinar Q&A. And remember that she'll be looking for questions from the Q&A 
not from the chat. So if you plugged into the Zoom, our Zoom webinar, just remember that we need to, that um, don't use chat, use Q&A and she'll manage that. Dawn McCarty is managing our clubhouse feed. Uh, so, and she'll be managing questions coming in from the social, and I will be handling the questions coming in from social media links via our restream. Okay, so uh, as monitors, our role, our moderators, uh, our role is to move the conversation along swiftly to allow for as many topics to be covered and for as many questions to be answered. So I apologize in advance if um, if I need to interrupt you because to try to fit in as many questions as we can. All right. So and we expect this this to go. Uh, probably for about an hour, but we're also leaving extra time and, and um, so we can fit in all the questions. All right, so panelists, I already explained who I am. My name is Danica Joan and I'm the founder and director of Kids Need Both. We have Elise uh, Price Tobler. She's a clinical uh, psychotherapist and she's uh, coming in here from Australia. Ann O'Keefe Rogers, she's the founder of Hope Springs, Florida, up in Jacksonville. And uh, let's see, Caroline Rena, she's our spiritual teacher, coach, interviewee in the Erasing Family documentary. We have Dawn McCarty, the founder of Safe at Home, um, and also a child of parental alienation. We have Junior Witter. Um, an advocate and Mark Hegarty, and they are also, they've also been affected by parental alienation personally. Mark Ludwig is the founder of Americans for Equal Shared Parenting. Uh, we're going to have Nathan soon. He's the founder of Hope Communities Platform that's helping us to create this uh, platform community. Uh, Shabon Olivero, and she is an attorney at Olivero Law in Brandon, Florida. Um, amazing. She's got an amazing, um, she, she teaches a lot about um, trying to like understand as, a, as an individual how family law is to go. Um, Stan Corosi, a psychotherapist and a reunification specialist. Todd Schulke, founder and director of Florida Families. Uh, Tori, Dr. Tori Evans Barton is the founder and CEO of Fatherless Generation. And finally, last but definitely not least, we have uh, Dr. William Burnett, and he's the Professor Emeritus at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine and the president of Parent Parental Alienation Study Group. Welcome, welcome. Oh, and oh, and I see you joined us. Thank you, Nathan. Um, thank you all for joining us. And we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I'm gonna start with Dr. Burnett's um, um, he posed, Dr. Burnett posed uh, something that he wanted to talk about. He wants to speak about the misinformation and, um, and he's also going to summarize how the five-factor model works for the diagnosis of parental alienation. So uh, Dr. Burnett, you get to speak first. Well, thank you, Danica, for the introduction and hello, everybody. It's nice to see everybody. Have, happy PAA Day all over the world. And uh, I guess just it's obvious that there are so many different aspects and so many different points of view having to do with the, to the general topic of parental alienation. There are so many different important aspects. And I think that among the group of us, we're gonna hit different topics. But the main one, I, I mentioned, Danica mentioned a couple of them. The main one I wanna make sure people know about is what we have been promoting, Amy Baker and I have been promoting the five-factor model for the diagnosis of parental alienation. So what is this? Well, one of the things we've gotten criticized about over years is our, our critics say, oh, there, there's no reliable way, there's no systematic way of, of diagnosing parental alienation. So uh, Amy and I put together a, a pretty, it, I guess I could call it simple, because the elements of it are pretty obvious, but I'm gonna run through them. And I, I, uh, this is all available on the website of PASG, or I have an article about it. I can send any of you, anybody who's listening, if you contact me, I can, I can send you the, the actual article. But, but it's called the five 
five-factor model. And let me run, I'm just gonna run down the five factors real quick. Number one is in diagnosing parental alienation, the first question is, is the child actually avoiding a relationship with one of the parents? Or is the child manifesting what we call contact refusal? I mean, that's pretty simple. And that, that's simply in the definition of parental alienation, that the child is avoiding one of the parents. So that one isn't very controversial. The second of the five factors is that the child previously had a good relationship with the rejected parent. And that also is pretty obvious that you have to be able to show that, that generally the parent has done a good job and generally the two of them had a good relationship, but now uh, due to events in the divorce and things that have happened, uh, the child is now rejecting the parent that they previously had a good relationship with. So let me just mention one little exception here. Suppose from the very beginning, suppose it's the mother who's the alienating parent, and suppose from the very beginning, from the child's birth, the mother took possession of the child and let the father have very little interaction. Well, in that case, the, the dad would not be able to show a previous good relationship, but our position is that can still be uh, a case of parental alienation. In fact, maybe even worse than an average case. So I just wanna explain that even though we have five factors, there might be exceptions, small exceptions. The third factor is, that you cannot show abuse or neglect or seriously bad parenting on behalf of the uh, rejected parent. In other words, this is that would be called estrangement. Estrangement is when the child rejects a parent for a good reason. Uh, but in alienation, you have to be able to show that that the parent has not engaged in abusive or seriously deficient parenting. So I, I think uh, so far, I think almost everybody would agree with this, even people who criticize the concept of parental alienation. So the fourth factor has to do with alienating behaviors, that to prove this in court or even in a, in a clinical setting, you have to be able to show that the preferred parent has manifested a number of alienating behaviors. And uh, you all might be familiar with the research of Amy Baker, that there's a list that many of us use of 17 common alienating behaviors. You know, like one of them is the parent uh, makes the child think that the other parent is dangerous or the parent withholds parenting time. Well, there are 17 of these. And so that's a criterion for diagnosing uh, uh, parent, parental alienation. And the fifth factor, which is that the child manifests some of the symptoms of of parental alienation. And, and as you probably know, there are eight common symptoms. The first one is uh, campaign of denigration and so on. One of them is lack of ambivalence. And that means that the child feels one parent is totally, totally good and the other parent is totally, totally evil. And there are eight of these that have been studied extensively. So if you, if you look at these five factors, oh, incidentally, we didn't invent anything new. I mean, all five of these have been around for 35 years but we have collected them into an entity that we call the five-factor model for the diagnosis of parental alienation. And what's interesting about them is all three parties are represented in one way or another. The rejected parent is, is represented in one of these factors, the child is represented, and the alienating parent is represented. So I just want everybody to learn about this and I, I hope clinicians can adopt it. I've used this in court. The court finds it very, very helpful and, and the courts, uh, quote it back to me. In other words, when the court writes a decision, the court actually lists these five factors and inserts uh, uh, examples of how different uh, facts of that case are, are found in the five factors. So uh, anyway, uh, I, I hope you all, you know, let me know if you need the, the article that spells it out or other information. Danica mentioned something about uh, misinformation. And in fact, uh, one, one topic of common misinformation actually has to do with the five factors. I mentioned that factor four is you have to be able to show that uh, the alienating parent has engaged in specific uh, of these 17 alienating behaviors. And fifth, you have to be able to show the child has symptoms. So there's a common misperception that, that of critics of parental alienation theory that what we say is different from that, that there's a common allegation that we say that just by taking a child who's refusing to see a parent, that we assume 
that the preferred parent is an alienating parent and is engaging in, in alienating behaviors. They have said this over and over again in published documents and articles and, and journals in presentations in court cases. Uh, and it's, it's incorrect. I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing this to y'all so that you know that, not, that when you hear certain criticisms of parental alienation theory, many of them don't make any sense. And this is one that we have been accused of this fallacy uh, over and over again, that, that the accusation is that we take a child who doesn't want to see a parent and we assume, we automatically assume that it's an alienated child who's been indoctrinated by the preferred parent. In other words, we do that without actually finding evidence of alienating behaviors. So that's a really serious form of misinformation. It's very common. If you happen to see it, uh, the, the, the answer to it is, show me in the PA literature, show me where it says that. Because even though that's, that is cited by critics of parental alienation, as far as I can tell, no writer in the PA literature has ever said that any child who rejects a parent is a result of the other parent being an alienating parent. I, I, I'm not aware that anybody has ever said that in the, in the legitimate parental alienation literature, because we would always say, well, there are many reasons, there are various reasons why a child might not want to see a parent. And you have to find evidence to find out which, what, what the right answer is. So anyway, those are a couple of topics. I know we're gonna talk about a lot of different things in the next hour, but uh, that's what I wanted to tell you all about. I appreciate that. I really do. Um, do any of our panelists have um, have some input on uh, what Dr. Burnett shared? Can I say something, Danica? Yes, go ahead, Ann. Dr. Burnett, first of all, thank you. I, as an alienated parent, as a professional, I am so grateful for the five-factor model. And what, in my opinion, needs to happen is in the same way that AA and the 12 step program is a household word, we need to have the five factor model become a household word so that in schools and faith communities and universities, the community at large is aware. Do you have any suggestions on how we can accomplish that? Sure, you can say the words over and over again. Uh, my friends and I have, have, of course, tried to promote this. We, it, it, we have this book, uh, Parental Alienation, Science and Law, and the entire book is structured around that. Uh, this has been published in places. It's been published in Ireland, and it's about to be published in Poland. Uh, and, and we try to bring this up in various places. And, and Amy and I actually did a survey of custody evaluators uh, where we asked them whether they agreed with this, and the vast majority of them agreed. So we're doing whatever we can to spread the word. I hope that anybody, you know, any of you or any practitioners, uh, you know, can, re can recite it <laughs> over and over, that especially, especially if somebody says, oh, there isn't any systematic way, you, you should say, hey, there is a systematic way. This is what it's called. And I'd be happy, as I said, to send the article to you that explains it uh, pretty succinctly. So, Dr. Brunette, um, I have used your article and I sent it out to many in the legal community and the mental health community, and I get the typical pushback. It seems that sometimes science, mm -hmm. or I'm sorry, the law is a little bit behind on the science, and that's where, at least in Florida, what I, my observation is, the courts can be so slow to embrace this and to see this this is a pretty much a plug and play you've got the five factors it's almost like a checklist and so that's really what it seems that kind of the community at large needs to like you say keep repeating it over and over yeah it's going to take work and i appreciate your interest and um i i, I think we it's one of these things where we all need to kind of tune in and get on the same page and push it ahead yes thank you Thanks, Anne. You know, you know, something that occurs to me, and uh, Shabon, you might have some, um, some input on this, is it seems like in the courts, they're really, they're not there to diagnose. They really are not there to, to even analyze it on a deep level. They are there to, to make uh, rulings. And 
by simplifying it and helping to like turn it into something that's more quantitative, um, I would say that that would help a judge um, to guide them into doing the right thing instead of playing it safe. Like, let's keep that restraining order on this person mm-hmm. because it's safe. It, in their mind, we're, we're keeping the family safe, but they're actually, um, you know, I would say if you can speak to that about how the courts ne- don't necessarily have the answer um, and by maybe doing this, it allows them to get towards the answer and know that they're not hurting a fam- family in the process. Yeah, so I mean, so I'm in Florida, so just so everybody knows, I can only speak to what happens in, in Florida. Um, that's where I'm licensed, and I I, I will tell you that it, it's it's very very hard to make a case of parental alienation. I was actually just talking to a judge about this during during this past week, just um, kind of casually about some stuff, and and the judge in passing said, you know, parental alienation isn't even a even isn't even really a thing. So, you know, they, they are finding that, you know, for them that it, it's not even something that they're, they're really leaning towards or, or finding any validity to. So I think, yeah, definitely having something like this could help bring some awareness to it. And yeah, Danica, like you mentioned, so courts are, the courts here are actually about, always about reunification first. So I actually struggle and fight to, um, to suspend time sharing and, and keep children away from parents who you know are abusive and are having issues and are doing those things because I tend to find that the courts, for me that I've been that I've been dealing with are all about you know, you know trying to to reunify to keep the parents you know and the children together and trying to build that relationship as much as they can, um, but it's it's such a an abstract thing I think for the courts to to grasp and to see and. You know, like for instance, right now I have a case that's going to be going to hearing in the next week where the mother is trying to build a case of parental alienation against my client, yet she's the one that moved to a whole nother state and moved away and only has limited time sharing because she moved and now she's trying to claim parental alienation. So, and is, you know, brought doctors and experts on who's never met with my client, never seen the kid, never done anything who these experts are saying it's parental alienation. So there definitely needs to be more education brought in um, for the judges and and I say even for some expert practitioners who are coming in and testifying to these things, because how can you make that claim when you've never even met with, you know, the, the party that's, you know, this person is alleging has done that. So, so Danica, I have one, uh, one question. It looks like it's from a parent. Uh, do you want me to mention names of the, of the parents or just ask the question? Just um, ask the question. Okay, so basically it's uh, for Dr. Burnett. um, How can the layman get a copy of this handout that you're referring to? My lawyer doesn't seem to want to take this information and put it in front of the judge. Send me an email. Um, Yeah, I'll I'll give you my email real quick. It's my name, William.Burnett, B-E-R-N-E-T, at the U-M-C dot org. VUMC is Vanderbilt University Medical Center.org. I'd, I'd be happy, anybody who, uh, who wants a copy of this article, this, this is the article that was published in Ireland, which is kind of neat. Uh, and sure. Incidentally, judges are so different. I mean, some judges understand this, others don't, others don't like it. Uh, last year, I testified here in Tennessee, and the judge said, Dr. Burnett, please do not talk to me about parental alienation. The judge said, I know more about this than you do. He said, I've been a judge for 30 years. I've seen many more cases of parental alienation than you will ever see. So you don't need to preach to me about parental alienation. And he was right. He was an older man. He understood it completely. And uh, so I I think there's obviously variation in different judges and in different communities. Okay, that's all I have. Okay, great. And um, things are going a little bit slow because we're 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 juggling and all. And I appreciate your your patience for here. Um, let's let's talk a little bit. I want to go into the topic Mark Hegarty brought brought up. He talked about gender division and negative campaigning. Being um, being unable to be a hands on father, I fill the hole in my in my heart by trying to create change as a way to support my daughter. 
I'm not in her immediate world, but I can try a positive to positively influence the world around her. And he's setting up an organization in the UK, and he's actually here from the UK in this webinar. Uh, he's aimed at educating men on how they can support women as a precursor to prevent domestic violence. Please, uh, and um, go ahead. Okay, Mark Hegarty, why don't you share a little bit about yours? And I know there are several people on here that can relate to this. In fact, Mark Ludwig being, and several of you are um, fathers, targeted fathers. Okay, um, well, I, again, the, the, a lot of, certainly in the UK, I see a lot of this huge, huge, huge gender division in the UK at the moment. And I see it a lot within the uh, parental alienation community, um, but certainly more so in the UK. There was, um, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, a very high profile murder of a lady called Sarah Everard, who was murdered by a police officer uh, whilst walking home uh, a couple of months back. Um, it started a huge campaign, um, which led to a lot of um, media, a lot of aggressive media, which you see. And this, this, this all come about from a conversation with a friend who said to me, what's it like being the enemy? And I said, what do you mean? As, she says, as, a, as a white, straight, middle-aged man. And I thought, I thought well, that's a really good conversation because, you know, I support Black Lives Matter. I support gay rights. I support women's rights. I support all these things. However, the, the, there's a lot of media focus on, on, on aggressive about men being wrong, men not doing these things. And I, the situation that, that, that we discussed that come about is I'm always in a rush to get places. And I'm sure you've all been in the situation where you're walking home and you have to overtake somebody, you know, a, a lady who's in front of you and you don't know what to do. If you hold back, you're worried that, you, you know, she might think that you're ready to pounce. If you rush past her, she might think you're actually going to pass. And I just thought, what can I do in this situation? And that sort of led to other conversations about, you know, well, what as a man, what can I do to try and make women feel safe? Because I haven't seen my daughter It'll be five years that I haven't seen my daughter. And, um, Whilst, and, and I really miss, like, as I'm sure, you know, most parents who have been alienated miss being a parent, and I really miss being a father. And I thought, well, rather than, um, because I can't, to, to fill that, that gap that I have in, in my heart, I can try and do something as a man to try and change, um, to say that it isn't, or, you know, not all men a rapist, not all men a domestic um, a domestic violence perpetrators. However, that kind of argument is, is sometimes isn't a, an argument that's going to resolve the situation that, that we're in. So the campaign, um, which fingers crossed, is maybe it's been maybe picked up as a documentary, is a journey that I've been through is to find out what can I do as a man to support, to try and help women feel safe, rather than, you know, the sort of being attacked, but take, in, take on all boards of the, all sides of the arguments. And then what I hope is that by, you know, coming up with a campaign that can be, that can be um, directed by and, by, and can be supported by men and by women, and also with, um, with campaigners who are saying, it's not all men, it's not all men, then with trying to get everybody involved in, let's do something positive, to say some, some kind of positive action that we can do as individuals. And by that, I don't want my daughter to be, to be abused. Now, the fact is, um, and it's uh, it maybe contentious, that it's likely that she's gonna suffer some kind of abuse in her lifetime because you know, that's the kind of thing that women, you know, unfortunately, regressively go through. I can't stop her, from, whilst I can't physically stop her from doing that, I may be able to try and I'll do everything I can to try and change attitudes to try and sort of as a way to try and stop, you know, prevent, you know, domestic violence from, from occurring. So, and then by sort of engaging with, with, you know, hardline, um, you know, let um, female campaigners, hardline male campaigners, as a lot of male, and, and try and, you know, once, if we can do something here, then maybe as a next step, then let's have the conversation about parental alienation, about, about false allegations. And 
Yes. Yes. I, I hear what you're saying, you know, a lot of times, um, I mean, and, and what I hear is you're trying to proactively do something positive because I think all of us who are on this, on social media, they li- we, we hear frustrated people and what do we do? We vent, we vent on Facebook um, and, you know, and, and it doesn't really serve uh, it doesn't serve us and it doesn't serve the people who are reading our posts if we're um, bashing our ex or even focusing on um, the ne- negative aspects of of them. Um, so I, I see that you're trying to to make a change, just be a light um, so that, you know, and be an example to your daughter. And Danica, what, what, what I see in this situation is energy. It is, and, and unfortunately, it's 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 a lot of it is, you know, understandably is negative, angry energy. If we can harness that energy into doing something positive, then we really have an opportunity to do something, you know, to work together to try and create a positive change. That's right. That's right. Um, there's several of us that I think all of us that um, you wouldn't have been invited if you were. <laughs> if you were putting more, if you putting negativity back into the space. And uh, I would, I acknowledge each one of you for, for being part of the solution and not amplifying, um, you know, that discouraged res- resignated space. Um, I know Mark Ludwig, I don't know if, if everybody knows who Mark Ludwig is, but um, Mark, why don't you share with us from a father's perspective, I, what I see is you're not only very well versed in political action, but you also are like boots on the ground. I'm gonna be in my kid's classroom as a substitute teacher if I have to, just to be in his life. So Mark, go ahead and, and uh, share with us a little bit. You know, first I wanna thank everybody on the panel who helped educate me. Um, I was totally naive to parental alienation, terms like projection and, and all these terms that I had no idea of. Uh, I'm the third father in line in my situation. And uh, unknowingly, looking back now, I was a part of alienating the father number two, not understanding the dynamics of what was going on until it was too late. And uh, I think that's the key that, that Mark hit on. There's so many people out there that are very uneducated and you have to be very careful how you approach these people because you can chase them away. And I noticed that in my political activities, my my main passion is fighting for equal shared parenting. Uh, I've been a part of 29 uh, states working on legislation. We did, by the way, pass a very solid bill in Arkansas a week and a half ago that just got signed into law. Uh, It's literally the most solid 50-50 shared parenting bill in the country now. Uh, And that's my passion, but I noticed myself as I was talking to legislators who I've known for 30 years, uh, they were very unaware of it. It wasn't that they were against equal shared parenting. They just didn't realize there was a problem. And I think that's where most people are. Uh, When I became aware of it, I started writing a journal, which I still have. I've got 37 books now that I've literally written to Levi every night before I went to bed. So he's got a, uh, a diary of every night of his life. But trying to find positive ways that uh, I don't put his mother down, but as I became aware of parental alienation, I realized that there was a high probability that someday he won't ever have any contact with me. And what if I die before he gets to hear the other side of the story? So I wrote a journal just basically letting them know from a positive standpoint, how much I love him. And and I'm very fortunate the school he goes to needs uh, substitute teachers. So I've, uh, this year I volunteered 17 days now as a uh, volunteer substitute teacher. And then I help out with lunch duty, recess duty, and I've never missed a week that I've been in town of surprising him at least one day a week because I didn't want him going all week long with no connection. Uh, Cause as many people are aware, phone calls aren't answered during the week. <laughs> and uh, I've never missed a, a week yet of at least surprising him one day at lunch in six years now of school. But it's, it's been a hard uh, fight to be a part of his life, but I think an important one. But, it, but it, I like your philosophy too, Danica, of not being negative of putting his mother down, but just trying to emphasize to him how much I love him, how much he's cared about. And uh, it really helps to have people like Tori. Tori is like a sister to me. Uh, I don't know that I would have gotten through this without Tori the last couple of years. It's, there's, I don't post on social media all the uh, things that go on, but as you all can imagine, 
it's not always easy. And uh, I'll tell you what, I, I sure appreciate people like Tori that helped me get through these last couple of years because there's a lot of uh, emotional alienating that I'm, that I'm up against right now. Awesome. Yeah, well, this is opportunity. Go ahead, go ahead, Dawn. I just want to say, first, I feel the same way about, about Tori. Um, but Mark, I love what you said about what you're doing <laughs> for your son. As an alienated child, one of the most precious gifts that I had was that my father saved certain things for me. He just knew that someday I'm going to want those things. And that went a long way towards my healing and understanding how he truly felt about me all that time. And that bridge so many gaps in between that just catapulted our ability to heal. So I commend you for doing that. And I hope that a lot of other parents consider doing that, making sure you're leaving those little breadcrumbs because it's evidence that you thought of them. And it's so important. So I'm so glad to hear that you did that. And I'm, I'm almost hundred percent confident that Levi will at one point have that day, that moment as well. That's right. It's, you know, it's really, it's about planting seeds, um, you know, and, and getting yourself educated as, as much as possible about it, because if you're left to your reactions, you probably will, we, we would all probably have, you know, burned bridges by leaving ourselves to our reactions. Um, Dr. Tori, would you like to, uh, why don't you go ahead and contribute seeing, seeing as how your name got brought up? Oh, well, I am, they're going to bring me to tears. I'm not, um, I'm not one to do all of that. You know, um, the work that I do, yes, we put some information out. We do what we best the best way we can, but a lot of the stuff we do is behind closed doors. When Mike, Mark says he yet wouldn't have gotten through it. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I just lived around the corner. He, he sent me a text and said, I think they're coming to your hotel. And it just so happened, I'd said, okay, I'm going to check the beach. And I walked along the beach and there was Levi. And I took a couple pictures, like trying to sneak and take them and um, sent them to Mark and he could see his son playing in the water. And then one breakfast, one morning, the next morning, what it was, I walked around the corner and Levi and I made eye contact. And I was like, oh, should I say something? Do I say something? I don't know what I'm supposed to say. And so I just let Mark know, I see him, he's at breakfast. And then he brought it up later that, I think Dr. Dr. Tori thought she saw you, <laughs> but I wanted to say something, but it was just those moments where I could tell him I see him, you know, whatever. And it was just a simple walk, you know, a block away. Um, and with Dawn, you know, my passion through the work that I do, you know, in reunification, I learned that a lot of the parents had so much trauma from their childhood that reunification was almost, you know, it was, it was like, it should have been further out sometimes, depending on the parent. They needed to heal their, their journey, their childhood journey that maybe they weren't even aware of. They weren't aware of the trauma that was happening to them. And now I get to coach people like Dawn and other individuals on a call to help them understand the cognitive part of their trauma. And if we're gonna talk about Parental Alienation Awareness Day, I've heard many people say, you know, a lot of people I talk to just aren't aware. What we're doing today is bringing awareness and educating them. Awareness is just simply knowledge and perception of, of a situation. Most people don't know. I'm in the space of fatherlessness, which alienation does create fatherlessness, but there are other tentacles. Most people say they don't even know that they're fatherless. Over the weekend, I'm in Atlanta. I was supposed to have surgery on Friday and it got postponed. That's a whole other conversation. And I'm grateful I can sit here and not be in pain. But I've had several people come by just to say hi. And some people who came from out of town to help me during this journey. And I can tell you, majority of them said, I didn't know I was fatherless until I met you. It means we have to have more conversations. Some of them are individual conversations. Some of them are on platforms like this. Some of them are on our social media page. But you wouldn't believe how many people are just not aware of what situation they're in because they're not aware, they haven't been educated and they don't know. And I've been blessed to reunite over 8,000 children with their fathers. We didn't know that was the number until December. We thought it was 3,000 and we did an audit and learned that it was 8,237, I think is the number. And learning that number, it makes me go, oh my God, 
but those aren't the people that I get to touch all the time. Sometimes I'm touching people like Mark and Dawn who no one knows about, <laughs> you know? I'm touching people that I'm just having conversations with. And that's where we have to be more um, intentional. Sometimes there's too many people who want credit. They wanna be king of the parental alienation and shared parenting and fatherless world. Sometimes it's just about having conversations with people that you're never gonna get credit for until you make it to heaven. So Danica, um, I'd like to make an announcement again for those of you who just joined us. Please be sure if you have any questions for our panelists to put them in the Q&A because the chat moves too quickly. But I did catch one um, on chat and this is for uh, Dr. Tori. Um, what would be a legitimate or legal reason to delay reunification due to one's own alienation as children? Um, I don't think there's a legitimate, unless there's some abuse, unless there's like physical abuse. I don't get involved in delaying. I think you can provide a holistic wraparound service as you're taking the alienated parent through the process of reunification. We have a four phase process and the, the, the therapy of someone's background is a part of that. But I'm not, you know, for me, I don't specialize in parental alienation, but I do see it. And when we have those moments and those issues, we do bring experts in who we know are part of that. I've talked to Dawn about a few things a few times. I've talked to um, Jenna Noble. I've brought other people into the equation because I'm not an expert in that. We can't be an expert in everything. And so we're going to bring um, people in who assist with that. But we're a wraparound service. We're going to provide it while we're going through. And if we see some red flags, I have had a person. <laughs> He's probably emailed all of you. When you find out that someone is an abuser and that's not a false allegation, you have to back away. You have to trust that and know that that's not, that's something else they need to go deal with. And I can't help them with that. And I'm not going to feel bad about not being able to help them, but I can give them the resources to get the help. And if they choose not to, then I have to move on. But we, we're going to provide it all at the same time. I don't feel like there's a legal reason not to reunite someone due to their childhood trauma, unless it's like physical abuse. Gotcha. I'm sorry, Caroline, did you have another question? No, some people are having trouble typing the, their questions in Q&A, so I'm trying to keep, follow along as best as I can with them. Okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah, we're working. We are... Uh, I got a question for Tori. Um, Dr. Tori, do you also deal with uh, clients that do um, face uh, issues of physical abuse and help them to realize where they may have run, gone wrong and help them to, you know, try to unify their, um, their relationship with their children outside of the physical abuse? I do. I do. So let me tell you, there are therapists who work with us. There are um, domestic violence individuals that I've become friends with over the years. And I'm gonna say, what is the barrier between these two situations and who can we contact? What's a good resource for them to have? Um, I'm a connector in life. And you know, over the years I've gotten a lot of people who um, I've just been connected to. And I realized, you know what? I can utilize them now. It's always pulling from your hat and realizing who can you use for this person? And it's tailor-made. Stop using the same person for everyone. Every, it doesn't fit. Every person doesn't fit every situation. And so I have to be discerning and instinctual on who's going to work. But yes, there are dads that we have, you know, they have drug abuse problems and we've sent them to drug rehab. It's like, let's get that worked out while we're working on your legal aspect. Let's get the abuse part. Like, who are you? What is the problem? We've actually reunited fathers with their fathers while reuniting them with their children. That's happened multiple times. And the issue was they weren't with their fathers and they were angry and they were they were struggling through things that they had been taught as children. Right. A lot of these fathers are fatherless mm -hmm. and the pain is coming from that place. And I see Barbara asking me, how did I come into this work? I was actually, in your terms, I was an alienated child. I grew up without my biological father, met him at 31 and reunited with him. And one of the people who came to be with me during this weekend and the support is my father's widow. My father passed two and a half years into me knowing him. Dawn and I have very similar stories. And my father's widow is very instrumental in my life. And to be able to share some of the things about him this weekend, we were sharing stories and I learned more about my father this weekend being with my bonus mom, <laughs> even after 16 years of, 
of um, being reunited with him, but he's been gone 13 years now. But having her, she's always sharing things that I didn't know about him. And that's been the beautiful part. But yes, Junior, I, um, I definitely understand what you're saying. And yes, healing is available for everyone. Right. And that, that's some of the work I try to do with also yeah. parents, you know, that are in, you know, are, can be abusive. You know, I, I try to gauge, gauge where they're at and try to, you know, create solutions or make suggestions of where they may have gone wrong and try to, you know, tone down the environment a little, right. And, and help them guide them, you know, in order to not be so abusive or, you know, to change their, their ways. So that's some of the type of work I do up here. Um, I'm glad you, you do that for our, mostly fathers, but also mothers as well. Everyone needs it, even including children. You know, I, I would like to point something out that, it, that I've noticed is, yeah, you're talking about this generational pattern yeah. of, um, that, you know, consider, just consider that every parent ha has in their mind the best interest for their child. And if they think that because maybe there might, might have been domestic violence between, between them and their spouse, in their mind, they're protecting their child from that domestic violence, which it's, it's totally different. You, it might be a very divisive uh, ex, you know, situation that triggers each other, but the parent-child relationship is altogether separate. But the protective parent is going to do whatever it takes, especially if they didn't have a father in their life. There They're going to try to control the situation. So really, I always, I, I, I try to say that whether you're a targeted parent or, um, or you're the one that's targeting, you're, there's personal, personal healing that needs to be done individually, you know, along both sides. I've seen it where, where a family uh, is perpetually in supervised visitation situation that goes for years on end. And that person is living into a narrative that, oh my gosh, my child will not be protected unless, unless they are in a supervised situation. And they just keep going on and on and on. So who needs the healing here? Is it the parent that needs to be supervised or is it really both of them? Both both of them they yeah. didn't accidentally meet each other they didn't accidentally I'm, I'm assuming yeah they didn't accidentally come into this this relationship no one was manipulated in that way I get that conversation a lot a lot of times we're attracting um the the parent that we're trying to resolve the issues with so many of these fatherless individuals they are attracting the same type of abuse, the same type of alienation, the same type of rejection and abandonment that they experienced in their childhood that they haven't resolved. And so they both need the healing. I totally agree, totally. All right, so who have we not heard from yet? We haven't, we haven't heard Dawn's story. I haven't heard from Stan um, and Todd. Uh, who else wants to chime in? We've got Dawn. You are a child who was, as a child, you were taking, taken away from your father and you, you had to track him down to, to have, a, so you were a child of alienation. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So my story starts off where first I was abandoned by my mother who had left us, left me with my father for about two years. So he was my sole caretaker for that time. And then she came back later after remarrying and they had a full-fledged abduction um, in LA and they, they had a getaway car. They had a, a houseboat available to them for an entire week to hide me out on while LA was looking for this miss, missing child. And then they had an airplane on the runway ready to taxi as soon as I was on board to take off and, and just whisk me away. So it took a, a little bit over a week to get me out of the state, but they, they eventually moved me from California to Colorado. And then things just, just happened from there. I had a replacement daddy almost instantly. Um, I was told as soon as I was put in the car, this is your new father. You know, your other father no longer exists. And anytime I talked about him, it was uh, redirection and telling me, no, that's not your daddy. This is your daddy. 
and um, I had new, a new house, I had new toys, I had new clothing, I had new everything. So nothing was familiar to me. And that kind of put me into this twilight zone or an identity crisis because I no longer knew what was up and what was down. And on, on top of that, I was also in a period of eight years, violently abused and almost murdered several times by one of the new family members. So it was a very traumatic experience and then continued, like it just didn't end. And it took me 44 years to find my father, but anytime I tried to ask my mom about him, she would shut me down. She would say things that would just scare me and not want me to ever look for him. She told me if I ever met him, I need to be carrying a gun with me just in case because I need to protect myself because he's such an evil man. And I think I have memories and thinking, I don't remember that. I don't remember him being, I don't, I was never afraid of him. Now I was young, but I have a lot of very vivid memories of him. So when I'm told all this stuff, it, it, I don't want to believe it. But then when I see, okay, so where is he? Why isn't he here? Has he sent me Christmas cards? Did he call me on my birthday? These were questions that I also asked my mother and she told me, no, no, we've never heard from him. So she let that sit and rot in my, in my brain. And she let my, my own opinion tarnish of him because there was no evidence that he cared. So there was a time where I would go, I'd be on a roller coaster trying to determine do I care or don't I care? Well, I don't really care right now because, you know, there, as when child or, children are angry, they don't necessarily process things accurately. So I had no idea what I really felt or what I really wanted. I just knew I was mad and I knew I wanted him in the beginning to come and rescue me and take me away from this hell. But then I thought, well, I don't know anything about that either because that could be a whole nother type of hell. So it, it was constantly on a, on a teeter totter on do I want to have him? Do I want to look for him? Well, maybe I don't. So it took 44 years to finally find him. And then when I did, as soon as I heard his voice, I knew, I knew that none of that was true. That I, the familiarity in the sound and the tone of his voice. And then when I got to see him for the first time face to face, that familiarity also came back. And I was, I just knew that this was not the person that she made him out to be. So that also helped in, in our, our healing and being able to put a lot of this behind and hear the truth. And one of the things that he was very, very careful about is that he never, even after all these years and after all the pain that he had endured, he never bashed my mom. Even 44 years later, he never said an ill word about her. He just said, I would ask him a question and he would think about, do I really want to answer this? Because it you know, may not sound right. He would say, first of all, I'm going to start with, I still love your mother. And then he would answer the question. So he was very, very careful about how he answered me so that I was um, confident and secure and, and felt safe to ask him questions. I didn't feel him coming back to attack me. So I, I think that he had a really good way to address the questions and concerns that children naturally have. We have that deep inside instinct, curiosity question that just kind of eats away at us. And we want to know those questions, but sometimes our emotions kind of make it confusing. And we don't, we act out with anger when we're really just so curious. And we just want to hear the words we want to hear, but we don't understand what's going on. So a lot of that just kind of went away. And it, I just felt this, this calming comfort of being around him all of a sudden. So it worked out really great for me. And yeah, 44 years, a lot of parents don't want to hear about that kind of time frame. And I certainly don't want anybody out there waiting for 44 years. That's why I'm out here sharing my story because we don't want that to happen to other parents. I don't want what my dad went through to happen to any of you. And I don't want other children to go through what I went through. So talking and sharing this information isn't about each of us as an individual. It's about all of us as a collective. And we all have to start expressing our voices and sharing these stories because people are going to become more and more familiar and understand the terms and what actually happens. And then they may be able to recognize it. And once they recognize it and they can see it and apply it in their lives, we're teaching our communities to be on 
the same path and the same um, goals as we are is to prevent this from happening. Yes, good. Yeah, you know, I what I hear is that it's it's about coming from a space of love in educating um, the community versus hate and outrage. Um, and that's where ultimately you, you might get attention, immediate attention with, with anger and, and fear even, even in the court. You might get you know, a judge to rule in your favor because you're so afraid. Um, but over time, the best course of action is being in a, a space of love and compassion for your child and and even for the other Absolutely. person you know like um just last week i had la in in march uh my children their father passed away and um so you know they're all in their 20s they don't know um what to do and stuff like that and i got the honor of helping them to uh, to, to respectfully and honorably bury their father and um that wouldn't have happened if I was this person who was, you know, I hate him and, and, and all these negative things. I'm not saying that I was perfect uh, over the last 20 years, but I would say, um, you know, I just kept being a stand for the children to have love and affinity for both parents um, was why it was I got the honor of helping my, my children through their grieving process. Um, well, and we, we got to witness that. Some of us got to witness that. And it was really a beautiful thing to watch how you were able to step in. And none of, none of what happened mattered at that point. You were there for your children. And what I think is really important, what I try to share with other parents is that I want to be able to, you to be able to reunify with your children, but we don't want that just one day. We want you to get invited to lunch, come back for dinner. Hey, come over Christmas morning. Would you walk me down the aisle? These are the things that we want parents to be able to achieve. And that means there, there is a lot of work and healing and sharing this information. Like with Mark, he, he has a job working as a substitute at the school. It's a beautiful way. One, it, it, it does two things. His son has an opportunity to see him, but also other people have an opportunity to see him as an, a, 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 an advocate or a volunteer in a position that he is respected. And that is huge. That's an ex excellent idea. That's a good place to put yourself um, in, in these situations as hard as they can be. But things like that, things like that help get you a little bit closer. Caroline? Yes, thank you, Dawn. I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm excited because I've got four questions here for you. <laughs> So um, let me start with <laughs> one, one second before you start, Caroline, because I want to layer into what Mark was doing with this with the school and my, myself. I'm part of this was the school board, um, part of the, the school council. I'm a parent. I was a parent um, a representative for um, my daughter's ward, and I'm trying to do the same thing now that she's moved into another uh, area of, of Canada trying to do the same thing there. And it's, it's very important that you are present um, as a parent in whatever aspect you can be, especially with education. And it goes, it shows a lot to your children and it shows a lot to the community in general. So I just wanted to say, Mark, that that's a very good thing that you're doing and continue and to others, um, even some, there's some attendees that are here um, that have done the same. Um, that's one of the best things that a parent can do is to continue to be involved, especially in education. That's one of the easiest things you can do. I think that's a huge point because the thing is, is, is to, not, to not work on the relationship side and only focus on the, 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 the court side is really going after the booby prize. You're not getting, I mean, the big win is the relationship and it may not look how you wanted it to look like uh, with, 50, 50, you know, timeshare and everything like that. But if you invested yourself in going after the relationship, why, you know, while doing what you have to do in court, you're, you're, it's a win-win. Okay. So Shabon, before you ask the question, Caroline, I'm sorry. Uh, Shabon said that she's got to, she's got to bounce um, real quick. 
before you go, can you, um, uh, would you like to say some final words before you, before you step out? Yeah, so thank you for having me on as a panelist. I have enjoyed hearing from all of you and you know how much you've overcome so that and that's amazing to hear especially from a lawyer's perspective so i'm a family law lawyer i'm also a certified divorce coach so i also try to help coach my clients and the families that are going through some of these things as well but it's so great to hear the things that you guys have overcome and what you're out there doing to try to bring awareness and education into this area because you know trying to deal with this inside of the court system as i mentioned before with a with a system that doesn't necessarily think that it exists or, you know, that it's that much of an issue or, you know, trying to, um, you know, help educate, you know, judges and other attorneys and all and, you know, everyone involved in, you know, the importance of, you know, why children need to be with both parents, you know, with equal time and how much that is so valuable to them. And, you know, Danica, I, I, I had my video off, but I, I, I will admittedly had a little smirk when you mentioned something earlier that said, you know, we, we kind of come from a view of, you know, parents are looking at what's in the best interest of their child. And maybe I'm jaded being a family law attorney, but I see, you know, in some of the highly contested family law cases that I do, that parents are coming from what's in it for me and what's best for me, not the best interest of the child where we should be focusing. And so trying to bring people back to, you know, the best interest of the child and your child deserves to have you know, a relationship with both parents and you need somebody in your corner fighting for you in your corner if you don't and helping you through that system. And so making sure you have a good team of people behind you. Mark, I am in Florida to answer your question. Thank you. And um, so um, I, I think that it's so important and I am glad that I have been here with all of you and to know that you are all in, our, in everyone's corner and that we can lean on each other as we fight for the families that are going through this. Thank you, Siobhan. Thank you so much for, for uh, joining in on the panel. I appreciate you. Um, we have, let's see here, and um, let's see. Caroline, do you have some questions? No, I have six now. So should I go? <laughs> yes, because I do want to, I want to, I don't want to lose um, uh, Dr. Burnett. I want to also bring him back in on those who didn't get into the early part of the conversation, I want him to talk about the five factor just like real quick. All right, okay. go ahead. Go so ahead. when I ask these questions, um, some of them feel like they're too, could be to uh, anyone who knows the answer and some of them feel like they're directed to Dawn, um, but try and keep the answer short so we can get over to Dr. Burnett again. Um, so the first question I have, well, are any panelists a gateway or representative to agencies or organizations that specialize in addressing malicious abuse of process, malicious prosecution, perjury, or bad judicial officers that conspire to abduct children away from their biological parents? Anybody? Well, I think a lot of this is still in the in the process. And I think a couple of these questions can be combined because I can see Valerie asking questions as well. So I know that um, Dr. Burnett, Amy Baker, there's a lot of people that are working on the forefront as far as the parental alienation. And also my partner, Elise Price Tobler, who um, wasn't able to attend today, but she's currently working on a PhD. She's a candidate studying a treatment protocol for adult children who have experienced parental alienation and or abduction as children. And then as um, my portion of it is, I look at the legal aspect and I also include the cybersecurity and the safety side on how important it is to provide a secure environment system for preventing some of these things from happening, especially abduction by a parent or a family member. So together we've partnered and created Humanly Possible Channel, which is a Facebook page. Um, and we've interviewed other adult survivors and we'll be starting to do some more interviewing um, as it relates to her PhD. And so it'll be official interviewing and studies being done. And then also, um, We've also interviewed other experts around the world like Dr. Burnett and Dr. Tori. And I mean, a couple of you on here, I've, I've interviewed, actually, I think almost all of you, um, we've had the opportunity to interview as well. So we're, we're definitely trying to root out solutions. Um, I think a lot of us are all focused on solutions and um, a, every little bit helps going towards being able to find that, being able to change laws. I know Mark works a lot with with the federal um, law aspect side of things. A lot of us also work on other levels of, 
of law, maybe on a state level. So there's a lot of things that are definitely going on. And I'll let Mark talk more about the federal side if he'd like. But the, the counseling and programs, I mean, Dr. Tori does some of the counseling programs there as well. At least we'll be coming. Dr. Burnett works with the PASG. So yeah, I think these questions can kind of be summarized. And at this point, I'll let Dr. Burnett and others take it from there and add their, their pieces to it. Well, I'd like to add something really quick because you didn't answer the one on bereavement. I mean, there's there's people I'm, I can I could probably answer this um, offline because I don't want to take away from any of the panelists who have this other information that you might be looking for. But I work with people who are in grief oh, yeah. and uh, who are who are going through a lot of anxiety. And so the one question she asked, how do the courts manage alienation issues when there's bereavement? They don't. <laughs> <laughs> and and, so, and I know Valerie and I know her story and she lost her father as well and it's kind of a, a very complicated story for her and, and we've lost our our family members our fathers have passed on Dr. Tori her father's passed on we do have that bereavement piece in there but that's why we do need to have some of these protocols or some of these counseling therapies um, in place yes. so that we can heal so the more of that more of that needs to also be occurring. So, I, and I see, I see some growth in that area, which mm -hmm. I love. Okay, I'm going on mute now, so there's. <laughs> I I do have somebody on our on uh, Facebook that's asked. I'm an alienated mom, and I need help. Can anyone send uh, help? Send resources. I'm in Washington State. So what? Um, what we are doing at Kids Need Both is we're creating a community platform called Hope for Families. And it's a platform not only to support uh, the effectiveness of the professionals, but also to provide, provide those professionals like the resources for the, the parents and families who need that and aren't, they don't know where to go. Like we're, we're all about, let's get all the good guys in one room so that the parents can um, can know that they're getting somebody who's gonna help their family, not destroy their family. Um, so I don't, didn't exactly answer your question, Charlie, but um, you know anybody who's a panelist who knows a resource in Washington state, of course we know there's Washington state and then there's the counties and the cities. So that's kind of a broad uh, question, but you can always contact us in a private message and we'll do what, our best to, to guide you in that direction. Um, I have someone, um, Kyle in, um, in Tacoma, Washington. He does parentlink.org. It's called parentlink.org. Parentlink.org. Got it. Thank you. Um, all right. There's also, sorry, there's one more, um, Jenna's group, which is Pathways Family Coaching as well. Um, you can contact them if they're in Canada, if there's an avenue for that. Okay. There we go. All right. Awesome. Um, I would like to, to loop around to Dr. Uh, Burnett. I haven't, as I heard, haven't heard much for Stan, from Stan. Uh, but I also wanted to make sure that Dr. Burnett gets a chance to tell maybe our new coming up I'll, about the five factor. I'll, I'll be here. Why don't, why don't we let the other people finish up who haven't said anything? I, I want to hear what Stan's doing in Australia. I want, to, I want a little update. Okay. That's okay. Perfect. Sure. All right. Stan, you're on. Yeah, there's a lot of threats to um, bring together here. So um, just quickly, my own alienation journey uh, is more than 15 years old now. And I bring that together with my own psychotherapy background. So I've been working with uh, alienated parents, mothers and fathers, probably for the last 10 years. And more recently, um, despite my protests, increasingly working within our family law system here in Australia, uh, bringing back uh, children and alienated parents together, okay? And so what I'm picking up on here, and also, sorry, the, the other aspect to this is like Elise, and Elise and I are actually doing uh, similar and different PhDs, um, sharing the same PhD supervisor, oddly enough. 
I'm looking at parental alienation from a social perspective or sociological perspective, and Elise is looking at it from a, a therapeutic perspective. Just drawing all the threads together, I, I'm sort of proposing that we're not just addressing a therapeutic problem of wounded parents. We're not just addressing a legal problem of trying to reunify families. We're also addressing a social problem. And so when we do our reunification workshops with parents, what I'm acutely aware of is that just because our family court system here you know, says you are now the parent of a child you haven't seen for the last five years, that doesn't mean that they're parents at a social level. Because one of the things that parental alienation does is that it destroys parenting identity. And so alienated parents have a lot more work to do than any other parents because they've got to recover not just their legal identity, having parental care and responsibility restored to them, they've got to restore a social identity. And one of the things that's come out of my research is this idea that parental identity is annihilated as a fundamental process of alienation at a social level. So most of the targeted parents that I work with what they're struggling, the question they're asking is, am I still a parent? Now, if your child dies, are you still a parent? Most parents would say yes. If your child goes missing, are you still a parent? Well, yes. Okay, if your child is kidnapped, you know, yes, you're still a parent. There are social responses to all of those cases where parents lose contact with their child because the child is dead, missing, kidnapped, where something terrible has happened to that child. But there's no organised social response to a parent who has been alienated from their child. Okay. So the other side to that is when we work with alienating parents, and I have to say, they don't volunteer to work with us, right? We've got to make them do that through our legal system. And even then, they don't do it willingly. But even for them, their social identity as, as parents is in question because it's the, of the way they're using that social identity. So what people like me are trying to do is add a social dimension to parental alienation. It's actually a social issue. It's a social issue of our time. It's very interesting that when parental alienation was first defined back in the 1980s, by Richard Gardner, Dr. Richard Gardner, you know, around that time, people were talking about how alienating society actually was. Well, that's an interesting coincidence, isn't it? That around that same time, he developed the idea of parental alienation. So that's kind of where I'm at. And the other thing I want to uh, pick up on is um, the comments about family violence. Here in Australia, we've had similar incidences over the last few days, quite literally, of men murdering their ex-partners, basically. And in, in a recent case, a father jumped off a damn wall with his nine-month baby, nine-month-old baby, and it's, it's a murder-suicide, and it's been couched in the context of family violence. Here in Australia, we have gendered family violence legislation that's applied specifically to men. So the issue we've got is at the same time that we want to take up the moral high ground of men, some men who are violent, but not all men are violent, we're faced with this ideology that says we are characterologically violent because we are men. So the additional burden that fathers have and I can only speak in the Australian context, is this idea that you are fundamentally violent because you're a man. At the same time, the last few cases I've worked on in our legal system have all involved fathers recovering their children after years of alienation. Despite claims of family violence and despite claims of child sexual abuse. This goes to another issue of are those claims false? Well, oddly enough, it'd be easier if they were. 
but the mothers who make those claims believe almost religiously that the abuse happened when it didn't. And they also assume that just because they say that it happened, that our legal system and the practitioners that work within it will automatically accept that as a truth, okay? The difference is, and it, this comes back to um, the five factor model that um, Bill talked about, is that within in the parental alienation sphere, we have a way of analyzing what actually happened. We have a way of formulating cases on an evidentiary basis. Who did what to whom? How did they say something? What are the narratives that are being used that alienate? So when we build a case for alienation, and what we call it here in Australia more and more is child psychological abuse by alienation, okay? Those cases can be very strongly evidenced. On the other side, the alienating parent who's claiming family violence and child sexual abuse very often, their evidence reads literally like, I think he did it. There you go. That's all I need to say about it. <laughs> okay. Those cases tend to get thrown out. And then we hear in the media about how our family court system is not supporting women who have been abused. It's a horrible social problem because the reality is that more men kill women. That's, the, that's, that's what the statistics say. Men are more prone to violent action. Um, there's a lots of reasons why that is. It's, it's not a simple problem. Uh, we have a, an old saying here in Australia that um, our national sport is responding to social problems by making them illegal. Okay, it doesn't work particularly well. So we haven't got a solution to that problem. Um, but coming back to my own lived experience, just quickly in closing, you know, somewhere out there is a, you know, is a 25 year old girl who doesn't have a father in her life, who has formed beliefs about her father, me, for which there's no rational basis to do so. But within a social context that says that men are characterologically violent, there's no basis for her to ask a question about that. And that's the big challenge that the ideology of all this poses to us in capturing the moral high ground, we've got to demonstrate that we simply are not the parents whom we are claimed to be. So it's not a question of denying what we have done or denying the negative, which you can't do. It's demonstrating at the highest level possible by the virtues that we have, that we are not the parents that they believe us to be. And that's been the sort of the, the thread that's run through, you know, a, a decade of work with alienated, alienated parents, that you just be the best version of yourself at every moral and existential level. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, that's my part for today. Hope that's been mm -hmm. helpful. Thank you, Stan. Thank you so much. You um, just like amazing, good stuff, good stuff because we're not um, making someone the bad guy. We're really trying to be our best self, be, be someone that um, the child would want to, uh, to be in relationship with. Um, and it looks like we've got an uh, Elise uh, Price Tobler joined our panel. Uh, yay. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you Good morning, everybody. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, coming in from Australia. Um, I wanted to, let's see, I also wanted to make sure that, uh, Todd, you haven't said a peep. So it's your turn. You're up and you're on mute. There you go. Well, thank you. Um, it's been very interesting and I, everybody has, you know, first of all, my name is Todd Schilke. I'm a small business owner in Tampa. I'm founder of Florida Families and I'm a, on the advisory board of Kids Need Both. Uh, I'm also a 
divorced father of two young adult children. And when I heard Dawn say, you've said this before, Dawn, but about your dad saying, I still love your mother. I still love my kids and I still love their mother. And, uh, you know, I think that, um, you know, I think there might be a punishment aspect to, you know, what a target, what a uh, alienating parent is thinking. But I think that the biggest thing gets to what Don or Danica was saying is that, you know, they're, they feel like they're protecting the kids from something. And that could be like uh, Dr. Tori was saying, you know, so physically harm, there's some harm here. There's a threat. This is, you know, this person is harmful. Or I think in so many cases, it's not even a physical threat. It's the threat is the other person's point of view, which reminds me of what Mark said when he said when it, that one day when my, you know, when I can tell my side of the story. I mean, I think there are three sides to every story. There's his side, her side and the truth. <laughs> and you have to sort it all out. But, uh, you know, without both sides of the story, um, you know, and, and that's the biggest fear, I think, sometimes. And I think that that is what is being protected is protection from that other perspective. And, uh, and I did definitely um, rang, all of it rang true for me. So thank you. <laughs> um, all right. Thank you, Todd. You mm -hmm. are a valuable um, part of our, our group. We um, meet every Monday to further the projects of Kids Need Both and um, in our brainstorming and stuff like that. And, and I, I love having you part of that. Um, let's see here. Oh, Dr. Tori says how a mother protects is different from how a father protects. That is so true. So true. Um, let's see here. We haven't heard from, we haven't heard from Caroline. We haven't really heard uh, Junior um, share. I mean, he's contributed and stuff like that, but share where he comes from. Um, and I don't know if Anne is still on or if she's off, off camera, but, uh, but who wants to go next? Caroline? Sure, and I have no idea what to say because I'm so focused on going on. <laughs> okay. And the questions and the great, um, great information. Um, so, I mean, I guess I could just introduce myself to those who don't know me and um, just kind of give you an idea of how I got here and the work I, I'm doing. But um, so my name is Caroline Rena. I went through parental alienation for 20 years. My children are speaking to me now. Um, and the things that I learned, my journey started, I went on a healing journey when I was probably in my, uh, probably late 20s, but it really didn't take off until things started with, with the um, alienation with my children. And it was more a journey into me. And that's how I ended up finding out that the answers are in here on the inside. And I was a mess. I mean, I'm talking for those of you who know what a dark night of the soul is being on the floor crashed down, you know, with the cover over your head screaming and crying. Um, I've been in that space. And my goal was to not let them win me. And so I went through this journey and pushed through it. And I feel like I am on the other side, of course, the journey never ends. So there's always little things that come up. But as a result, I um, learned how to do spiritual coaching. And I've started working as a mentor and teacher. And like I explained, like I said earlier, you know, I help people with grief and anxiety. Um, I was also a protagonist, get this right, Dawn. <laughs> I was a protagonist and interviewee in a racing family. And some of you have seen it. Um, if you haven't, I highly recommend it. And that movie was actually a turning point for me and a catalyst to some more healing uh, from this. So my thing is all about healing. It's all about self-healing. It's all about working through and connecting with, you know, who we, who we are and learning how to, I don't remember who said who Mark was talking about it, but someone had said something else, the anger that we hold when we have gone through something like a divorce, especially when we lose our children is over the top. And the anger is the thing that keeps us locked in. And what I discovered was if we can just take that anger and turn it into passion, like we all are doing here because that's where it came from. 
at least that's my belief, that we can turn something like this into a healing journey for everyone who um, is experiencing this and eventually and um, hopefully connect with people and meet them where they're at and guide them you know through this process it's, it's just so important and i'm grateful to have a couple of their or, or counselors <laughs> on here because they've some of them have been my lifeline you know so um and coaches so anyway um and i say this every time danica thank you for pulling all of this together and i'm just so grateful and i'm happy to be here awesome well, we're happy for have to have you I've, um, okay, so let's see who wants to go, who wants to share a little bit, Junior or Elise? I'll, I'll share. Okay. Um, and I thank you guys for inviting me here. And of course, and with uh, some honored company, Caroline, Rena, thank you for involving me in, in your, you know, Facebook first and on to others. And I, I enjoy what you do. And Tori, of course, Mark, everyone here, yeah, Danica especially Don. Um, Don, you especially give me a perspective in order to have a great relationship I have with my daughter and to understanding how it, an alienated child parent um, does think. And I thank you for involving me, you know, including me into that world. And that's very important for a lot of us parents that are you know, potentially alienated, if not get kicked against uh, our own will. Um, I come from a situation where, you know, there's constant attempts of brainwashing, gatekeeping, um, to the point where it, it is alienation. Um, the, f the five factors are there, but they're not recognized, right, of, of course. But, you know, I continue on. I do what Mark does as well, you know, uh, involve myself in the school, um, go around politically. Um, I work with the Canadian Equal Parenting Council up here as a political group of lobbyists, um, I work with another number of different organizations in Canada, you know, to, to kind of move the chain and to you know keep keep my inspirations going and as well as you know, I've seen what, what it's done to my daughter, what it's done to my family, and you know, I want to help others. And through helping others, it, it gives me more strength to do the work that I do now um, outside of my full-time job. But um, that's all, that's a whole nother story. But the reason why I you know, became more involved is because I want to change. You know, I don't want to sit, you know, become sit, sit in victimhood and you know, you know, mellow in my trauma. Uh, you know, I, I want to make 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 a difference in people's lives, especially my own family. You know, I've been I'm married. I have two other children here, and you know, we're all blessed. And my daughter gets to see that. You know, whenever she is around and wants to enjoy more of that, and that's. That's the best thing that any parent can do is create a whole nother avenue that that child can now see that you're you're living a positive life, right? They don't want to see negative. They want they want to be in a negative state. They want to see that you know the two parents are getting along and, and making things happen. And that's what I'm trying to do, right? And through that, I'm actually showing the other side, you know, what 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 it takes to to make things positive, you know. No, let's not focus on the past, let's move things forward. And that's what I try to do with other, when talking to other parents, um, some of the panelists that are here, they, they know who I am. I've, you know, coached them and they've coached me in return, right? It's, it's a whole family, family affair. So that's where I come from. That's, that's a brief, um, brief synopsis of where, who I am and what I'm about. And if there's any questions, let me know. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Junior. I appreciate you. All right. Uh, let's see here. Elise, welcome from Australia. Thank you for joining us. Um, share, uh, I think, um, do I have here? It says here that you were, you were talking about the long-term effects of severe parental alienation and abductions. You want to talk mm -hmm. about, about that? Yes. Hello, everybody. I've, um, it's um, 5.30 here in Australia. So sorry, I was a little bit late. I thought you were starting at 6am. So hi, Stan, <laughs> my Australian counterpart down there. And 
Hello, everybody. Hi, Dawn. Hi, Caroline. Hi, everyone. Hi, Dr. Burnett. It's very nice to see you all. So um, forgive me if I'm a little bit slow still. I'm still having my first cup of tea. So um, my name is Elise Price Tobler. I'm a clinical psychotherapist. So my entire life is around um, involved with parental alienation. I'm actually an adult child of severe parental alienation and abduction. So I speak on that level. I also speak, I have my own practice and I speak to um, adult children and parents of alienation professionally. And I'm also doing a PhD on parental alienation. So I'm um, studying and trying to design a treatment protocol for adult children because the symptoms that we can experience can be very um, diverse and complex and a lot of the time when we go to seek help from mental health professionals a lot of the time when we present they're often quite confused as to um, what's happening for us and there can be quite a lack of understanding there. So um, I also work with Dawn very closely. She's another adult child of severe PA and abduction. So we have the Humanly Possible channel where we interview people from across the world, a lot of adult children and um, parental alienation specialists. We've got a fantastic interview there with Dr. Burnett, if anyone wants to go and have a look at it. And um, at, I'll just briefly, uh, I'm from Australia, study in Australia, work in Australia, and I just wanted to read out some of the um, effects that can happen to adult children if they're not, um, if it's not picked up, if they're not worked with when they're little um, or when they're adolescent, because some of us slip through the cracks. Um, uh, children who may or may not be going through high conflict divorce and slip through the cracks and don't receive treatment are a big are a big problem and currently there's about 3.8 million children in America alone who are experiencing moderate to severe parental alienation so we really need to start nipping that in the bud because we do not want to be treating adults um, later on down the track because the effects on them can be long lasting and often absolutely do not go away. So um, some of the things that adult survivors might experience are expressions of guilt, depressed mood, low self-esteem, they lack self-confidence, they can experience distress and frustration, substance abuse, delinquent behaviour, separation anxiety, suicidal ideations, they can attempt suicide, they can also manifest with sleep and eating disorders, educational difficulties, hypochondriac, hypochondria, sorry, psychosomatic illness, um, and fears and often different phobias. So they also live with a lack of self-esteem, which I already mentioned, lack of trust, um, and often we can also see a pattern coming through to the generations that are following. So they can also um, experience a rejection from their own children, a lack of belonging, choosing not to have their own children because of their experiences as little ones as well. And um, they can live with a lot of resentment and bitterness over lost time with alienated parents and um, there's a lot of very serious mental health challenges that go along with this so that's where Dawn's and my work is and um, an extra layer on top of severe parental alienation is abduction so some of us in the high conflict divorce and fight have also been um, taken from the other parent and in my case uh, for instance, we were given different names and taken across the state. And uh, that's a different layer on top of severe parental alienation. So now we have to look at what is our identity, what's happening for us. We are often taken away from all the family that we know. So this is also something that I'm studying. 
um, and adding to my PhD. So yeah, that's just a new, a big area of interest, particularly for Dawn and I. So yeah, basically, I don't want to bring things down too much, but this is the world that we do live in. So um, yeah, thank you for listening to me. And um, I'll just uh, leave it at that at the moment. Yeah. You know, you pointed something out um, that a lot of times parents will want to insist on uh, their child testifying and talking to the judge and they, they may, but they don't get that they are putting their child in a position of betrayal that may not manifest itself now, but down the road um, that can really uh, create such a detrimental, such scars in that child's life, mm. especially after, after the parents, maybe, maybe the parents have gotten past the alienation and stuff like that. I, sometimes I, I, um, then everybody's getting along, but that child is like, I said, I, I did horrible things. I, I did horrible things to one parent. Um, and, and it's my fault. They don't look at it as well. It was my it was my parent who made me do it. Um, just just it's just it breaks my heart to see uh, parents just determine that you know a twelve year old or whatever um, speak and um, you know and sway the judge in a court court case. Hmm. Well, what they don't realize either is that we actually do grow up and they might stop fighting but the legacy lives on within us and it doesn't stop. And a lot of the time, what we'll also see is it'll just affect even at my age, just the, it, it will affect everything from um, funerals that we might go to, which is a recent example. Uh, they, they can be arguing still at this age about stuff that's happened 40, 50 years ago. It's like, no we don't want to hear this anymore like we're trying to heal we we're trying to move past it and you guys are still carrying this torch so yeah it's very very interesting and a lot of people think I suppose that once they're they they turn 18 everything's going to be fine so and we're here to say it's not and that's the work that we're doing in this space right so oh, I've got I've got a question that's going to come through through someone else and through me. It's it's interesting because I think it affects all parents and we've even uh, walked through this too. Um, and I, I believe this is for you, Elise. I don't know for sure. Um, how do you talk to a child who's going through parental alienation? Yeah, it's a big it's a pretty big question. How do we talk to them? Um, who is we? <laughs> How, how do you talk to a child? I'm assuming it's a parent. Um, I know that, you know, even having gone through everything and my children still talking to me, some days I still have a hard time talking to them. So how do you do it? Oh, okay. Okay. So the biggest thing that worked for me when I reunited with my father after 25 years was him giving me unconditional positive regard and just being able to listen to me without judgment. It's really simple. And sometimes I'll still unload on him. I'll still have things coming through because PTSD is part of who we are mm -hmm. and it'll come through and my hat is off to him. I tell you, because he listens to me. He, gives me space I can ring him 24 7 I know he's always there even though he wasn't there for 25 years because of the severe PA or spa as we call it so and this is what I say to the parents who are coming in you've got to remain hopeful you've got to remain um keep the space open for them you've got to be a healthy person yourself you've got to get on with your life you have to model to the kids that they're safe in your space because often when we're at home with an alienator that space is not safe for us so if we get an opportunity to go to the targeted parent they just need to give us that unconditional positive regard and just hear us and sit with us and not judge us and not pour any more stuff in our heads in a nutshell. Yeah, and I'd like to add to that, 
I'd like to add to that, like I mentioned earlier, how when even when I was asking the questions of my father, I came to him and asked him some pretty tough questions. And his response first started with that, first of all, I want you to know that I loved your mother and I still love your mother. So he started me off in a non-defensive position. I didn't feel like I had to defend her. All I needed to do was listen and absorb what he was saying. And it put me in a better place as, as the child trying to decipher, because when we come to terms with this, when, when you finally are faced with, I need to decide what's true and who I am really, because we were full of holes. And, and at least I've talked about this many times where, and I describe it as, you know, a lot of times you might've seen that picture circling the, the web where there's a, it's like, it looks like a sculpture of a father, a stone figure holding a child's hand and they have a bunch of holes in each of them. And what that represents for me is the holes that were inside me were the parts of me that I were, you know, that I had missing. And those, those, each of those holes were um, on the outside edges of them had this red inflammation, painful um, parts that I needed to suppress. So I'm packing those holes with something to make that pain stop. And then when we come back and we start asking the questions, that pain is still there just because we unpack it. It, it has never been resolved. So it's very important on how we speak to the children to let them, it, you know, that it has to be done very gently. And, and Barbara also asked the question about how do you help your child recognize that they're a victim and seeking help. And that is, um, of, it depends on the child and what they went through. We all have different situations, different events that happen, and we have different levels of pain or anger or understanding. Sometimes we may understand that we just have to survive and we're just doing whatever we have to survive. We may not like the situation. And then other times we're so wracked with the anger that we can't even comprehend what's going on around us and who's right or wrong. We're just mad at everybody. So there's so many different levels to that, but understanding that the pain is still there, no matter if we are five years old or 50 years old, we still have to address it. And we have to take every single piece and analyze every single thing that we were ever told and determine, is this true? And if it's true, then I have to deal with that. If it's not true, I have to get rid of that because we can't deal with things that are not something that we can use to heal. And that's a process. It takes a while to go through. So that unconditional positive regard that Elise talks about is the best way for a parent to um, make sure that their children feel safe for any conversation and that it's not going to be a retaliatory or um, another heated discussion because that is what's gonna make them just go back into those holes and cover them back up and just not wanna deal with them. You know, you you bring up a lot because I, I think that parents, when it's so easy to defend, you know, you've got a child that's uh, even an adult child that's, that's asking you questions. Well, questions have a want to be answered. And the, I think that sometimes the child is asking the question, not necessarily wanting to hear you make their other parent wrong in the matter. They just want, um, and you know, it just, it's you just got to heal yourself and not be triggered. You got to be Teflon, be able to, to, to take whatever it is that they dish out and say, I understand. Yeah. Cause this is about trust now. Now it's all about trust. Can I trust you? And if you can make me feel comfortable and confident and that I am safe in this conversation, that trust is going to grow exponentially faster than it would if I have to constantly shut it down. Because we, like, like Elise said, we have this chronic PTSD that follows us through life. And when it starts getting complicated like that, we have to shut it down. If we can't, if we can't deal with it, our only choice is to shut down. So we need to be able to come out and we need everybody to, um, have a place that we can exist in a conversation without it becoming that complicated. And, and sometimes we're asking the question, we're not, we're not necessarily asking you to make um, any kind of excuse. We're asking you straight up, give us a straight up answer in the most loving and caring, positive regard way that you can. 
because they at this point it, it's it goes back to that trust we need to build a trust and trusting means that you trust me with the truth very good and you popped up on the screen so i guess that means you're <laughs> <next>. <laughs> i apologize i'm bopping back and forth we've also got a retreat going on at the resolution center so i'm just so glad to be with y'all awesome Again. and uh yeah and ann uh, uh initiated um a vigil a three-day vigil and uh uh, Friday, Saturday, and this morning, um, just a, a prayer vigil to just to generate all that um, that we're creating right now. This whole positive uh, healing environment of um, of this panel discussion. So, thank you very much. Just, do you want to, Anne? Want to you want to share a little bit of, of of your insights or or what you do? Sure. sure. If I could just have two minutes, I'll share briefly. Um, and I love what Don just talked about, like almost that thick skinness that we need to have as alienated parents that our kiddos can come to us with anything, any subject, even if it's a sticky subject, a subject that perhaps might make us want to fly off the handle, but we're not going to fly off the handle because we're trying to work on being resilient and being faithful. Um, briefly on faith. About seven years ago in a support group in Ohio, I met a gal and she and I prayed together every single day. And we've done this for almost six years now. We pray for our exes, we pray for our children, and we pray for our spouses. We pray for our entire community. And that has been one of the most powerful sources of strength for me to get to a healthy place where I am now. So fast forward, I have a conversation with Danica, who also is a person of faith and resilience. And we had a, a three day prayer vigil leading up to today, Parental Alienation Awareness Day, with the goal and the intentionality of praying for peace, grace, and patience. And those three days of prayer, I mean, it started the day off great. Just like when I pray with my friend in Ohio, when I pray for my ex, I pray for my children, I pray for my spouse. Lifting that up in community, it is so empowering. So like what Danica is doing with this panel, I mean, I, I, it, it brings me to tears. I'm Irish. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, an, I'm an Irish and a woman, and sometimes I cry. But when I look at the list of all the people on this panel and all of the attendees in the audience, and I pray for them all because we're all broken inside. We all have a journey. And those of us with PTSD, you know, we're doing the best we can, but we're all broken. We all have the holes. We just want to make sure our kiddos know that they have a parent who's healthy and whole to come back to. That's right. Yes. I love that, Ann. Um, I want to um, really quick, because I want to end it with Dr. Burnett, um, kind of back looping back where we started. I want um, Nathan because he hasn't spoken and he's not necessarily been in the in this family stabilization community, but he's uh, he has been like right there by our side as our technical guru coach. So um, Nathan, I'd like you to share a little bit, um, you know, what your part to play is in this. Thank you, Danica. Well, I have a personal experience. Um, I don't know if it's classified parental alienation, but my mom really tried to destroy my relationship with her father because she was hurt when her relationship with him ended. And instead of finding an amicable way to have a relationship with her children, she tried to weaponize them to hurt my dad. And my, that, that didn't work for me. I was 18 and I discovered for myself like, wow, I really wanna have a relationship with my dad. And I got his point of view, which I hadn't had up until that point. And my whole world shifted inside of me being like, I want to have a relationship with my dad. 
and that's what we've created since I became an adult and was able to get that whole world. Um, what we're creating here, uh, Danica and our whole team, is we've created a social app, a social learning and uh, discovery app. And when I say discovery, I mean the ability for families and uh, parents to come to this app to get access to e-learning materials, to attend events and panels, uh, to join community groups, you know, because I, I think I think that's not just in this parent uh, parental alienation conversation, but I just think generally in society, there's a breakdown in community and we're not having uh, communities that are forwarding the personal development of people. So, you know, we've built an app uh, for Danica that uh, supports that and you know, you can go to hopeforfamilies.com uh, forward dot slash welcome, I'm sorry, dot net forward slash welcome to, uh, to look at the registration page and to, act, and if you register for this event, you're actually already registered in the platform. Um, and you can just log in or uh, with the credentials you use to set it up. But I just want to say that this is such an important conversation because I'm the founder of the Hope Platform and we're basically a movement of movements. And I'm really passionate about families having workability because if you look at anything, whether it's drug addiction, which is a serious thing we're, we're looking at taking on, you're looking at any breakdown, it really comes back to what is their family like? Were they loved? Were they, uh, you know, what does that look like? And so, you know, the platform is really just about facilitating collaboration with, with you, the professionals, and we have a directory. So by centralizing not just the community aspect, the social aspect, and the learning aspect, but also having a directory of professionals, uh, which we'd like to have all of you listed, and some of you are, are already listed, but having that available because people are looking for resources, right? And we want to make sure we're directing them to people that are actually going to produce value for them. They're not going to direct them down a $30,000 one year contentious divorce, but actually can help them to get at the root of what they want to accomplish at the next stage of their life and to have a healthy family, even if it means separation, and that's okay. But, you know, we need to have uh, a movement. We need to have a centralization of these resources, whether it's the learning modules, whether it's the events, the community or the, the directory of it, of, of it all. So, you know, we want to invite you to be a part of uh, the team, uh, we'd like to also as panelists, we'd like to have more conversations like this, actually having more live streams and broadcasts. I get having 14 people in here. We don't all get to like talk all that much, but maybe we can do a series over the next couple months and we can do two or three of you at a time. And that way there's a more expansiveness and we can dive deep with each of you. But those are some of the collaborations we like to create. And ultimately it's about collaboration. It's like, how can we work together to make this work? And the marketplace is plenty big for all of us, I think, especially considering how much money gets washed out in divorce. I think there's plenty and there's just plenty of work at this stage to be done. So we want to foster collaborative partnerships with each of you. And I think that's why we're all here. So that's uh, that's all I want to share. If anyone else wants thank to you, say Nathan. anything. Thank you. Hey, Danica. Yes. But before, I know we want to close with Dr. Burnett, but um, uh, could I say a few words just about our work together? Of course. Uh, the um, Florida Families, it's the group that, uh, that I founded um, with, uh, with two other partners. We're an alternative to adversarial family court litigation that helps parents who are contemplating divorce uh, make better informed decisions. Um, we take our inspiration from a quote from Buckminster Fuller, which says you never change things by, change, by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the old model, the existing model, obsolete. And um, so Florida Families is a community outreach, outreach group. And uh, Kids Need Both brings vetted professionals uh, resources who are all about empowering parents and um, including keeping them out of family court if, 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 if possible. So it's a, a little different angle taking, uh, taking the approach that we're taking together. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I've, um, I've, I love the partnerships. I think I, from 20 years ago when I was seeking resources and just, uh, just desperate for, for anything and everything, 
it was it was difficult to to find that and my mission 20 years ago was to to pool everything together get everything um together for and then i sort of like you know passed it forward and said here i've collaborated and that was when i just barely knew about web pages and stuff like that and i put all the the resources i found on one page so this is definitely you know 20 years down the road creating this um and it's not launched yet it's in pre-launch phase so the goal is um uh, so you guys are the first to kind of really know about it all right so I, yeah can i add one more thing yeah. um the name of the game nowadays with all the internet and stuff is content and I mean, how many of us get overwhelmed with creating content, whether it's video broadcasting, it's just too much. You got to create, create, create. And it's just like you're spread thin. Well, the idea is, is we can work together to create content. And that's what we've been doing in my network. And that's what Danica is starting to do is creating a syndicate of content. And we work together to create the content. And we also work together to share the content. And we found the secret to virality or the secret to reaching and penetrating the market is working together to share across the entire community so you know that's why i think ultimately this is going to be effective is because we're working together to to get the message out to get the message that this is even a possibility that there's another way exactly you know i don't need to be um i mean i've got lots of rec recognition on my wall but it's not really to me i'm thinking if i could um forward the the expertise of all of you all you panelists in the room um then my voice gets expanded exponentially because i'm speaking about your event and you know what you have your book and stuff like that and if i can do that for you guys we all win um all right so last three minutes and i want dr burnett to to share what he shared at the very beginning for those who missed out Go ahead. Hello, y'all. This has been a great way to spend um, some time on Parental Alienation Awareness Day. And thanks to Danica. Thanks for all these wonderful ideas that, that have come up uh, from Mark and Tori and Dawn. And then Nathan had some really good ideas. My, so my, my little tiny corner of this all this big picture is in writing articles and chapters. And the, the thing that Amy Baker and I have been pushing the last few years is a method for diagnosing parental alienation, which we call the five factor model for the diagnosis of parental alienation. And if you want it, if you want the article itself, the easiest way to get in touch with me is to go to, go to the website, Parental Alienation Study Group web, website, which is pasg.info, I-N-F-O. So I'll give you a real quick rundown of the five factors in the five factor model. First of all, the child is rejecting a relationship with one of the parents. Secondly, the child used to have a good relationship with the parent. Thirdly, it's not because of abuse or neglect on the part of that parent. In other words, the parent is a, is a good parent that the child is now rejecting for, for without a good reason. Fourth are the alienating behaviors, uh, but there's plenty of research on these, but we, there, we typically count 17 common alienating behaviors and uh, you have to have some of them you don't have to have all of them but you have to have some of them for factor four and factor five are the eight behavioral signs or symptoms of alienation in the child uh, these are the same eight things that Richard Gardner talked about in 1985 and we still use the same criteria so what's in what's interesting is that all three members of the triad are involved in these factors, the mom, the dad, the child. And the other thing that's really important is that this is not a whole new invention, that Amy and I have simply collapsed together uh, the ideas that have been published for more than 30 years. And, and so we try to make it systematic, to make it look like it is, is, is a coherent whole and, and that both clinicians can use it in making the diagnosis and in court, it can be used in court for making the diagnosis. So that's my little, my little spiel. But uh, this has been a great activity this afternoon and uh, we appreciate everybody's involvement and uh, hope to see you soon. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you, Dr. Burnett. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you for 
our wonderful panelists that I'm sure we'll be in touch again very soon. We are, our goal is to do a panel discussion once a month. This is the first of, of, um, of 12 over the next 12 months. So, um, and we're gonna try to get different ones and um, maybe we'll size it down to a smaller group so we can actually uh, talk about a specific topic, who knows. Thank you for joining us and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And, um, and remember April 25th is Parental Alienation Awareness Day. Um, and there's a, such a group, such a huge community there for you. Have a great evening. Say goodbye. Bye-bye. 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 Good, good work, Lucy. All right. Okay, in stream.